So welcome to you all. Welcome to our eighth webinar. Today, concentrating on rinsing performance. In the new IC, we will have two methodologies to measure the rinsing performance. And we have one expert of all this rinsing performance measurement, which is Michael Munich, which I welcome very much. And I hand over to him to give us this presentation. Yes. Yeah. As Rainer said, good morning, good afternoon, good night, or good evening, wherever you are. Um, First of all, um, I see a lot of, let's say, known names in the in the participant list, but there might be some who uh, don't know me. Um, so my name is Michael Munich. Um, I still have my camera on. I didn't have a, let's say, a recent picture of mine. So I um, can see me on, on the video screen. I will turn off the camera in, in a few seconds because it's maybe easier for me to, and, and for the uh, connection. Um, so I've been working for BSH for more than 10 years. I think I started in 2012. I'm involved in the develop of washing machines with uh, the focus on washing programs and uh, performance aspects. And since the beginning, I've been involved in standardization work. And uh, this is on European and international level. I'm the convener of Working Group 20 in the SC59D, which is responsible for rinsing efficiency methods for laundry appliances. And I'm also the convener of um, the Senelec uh, subworking group 1.8, which is the maintenance, which is now called the maintenance team for Senelec TS5677. And this TS, this technical specification, is the um, method for the LAS, LAS measurement, um, which we also will now integrate in the sixth edition. So this is, um, that's why Reinhardt calls me an expert um, of forensic. So let's go on. Um, today, I have a short, I made a short agenda, um, a little bit of introduction. What do we do? What are the general steps that we have to perform besides everything else? I mean, I will not go into the details of the normal um, performance measurement. This has been done in the last um, webinars. Then we will go to the alkalinity rinsing performance. Um, this is a method most of you know, but um, there are still some points to consider and there are differences. And I want to point out some important things that might uh, lead to a better repeatability and maybe also re uh, reproducibility. The fourth point is the LIS rinsing performance. This is uh, for most of you a very new method might be the first time that you measure it might be you haven't done it so often some labs have done it quite some time and in the end there will be a small summary um and so i will have um time for questions after the alkalinity rinsing performance and the ls rinsing performance because i think if it's fresh um it might be uh, good if you have questions that you ask them immediately afterwards so uh, I think this picture you might have seen quite some time in the last webinars. And I want to point out that today we talk about two, those two points. This is the alkalinity rinsing, rinsing performance and this is the um, LAS rinsing performance. And as you can see, they come from different parts of the washing performance, uh, from, from the measurement of the washing performance. And they differ in some points. So that's why it's something which is very important that you have to know. Um, let's go on. In the sixth edition, as Rainer said, we will have two different measurements for rinse performance. This is the alkalinity rinsing performance and this is the LAS rinsing performance. Um, very important, you cannot compare the one with the other. They measure something completely different. I will come to this and that's why they focus on different things. Um, coming to the general steps, um, there is actually nothing new in normal procedure. The only difference is in the uh, preparation of the load. Um, that's a new fact. This is also important to know. Um, 
For the LAS rinsing performance, we take the unsoiled swatch of the stain strip. Um, and it's very important that you do not mark anything on this uh, stain strip with a pen, um, because we cannot guarantee that this influences maybe the measurement of the LAS rinsing performance. That's why mark everything on the sebum. It's still readable afterwards, uh, no problem. Second, we measure up to five of those uh, unsold swatches. And we measure always the first five that are put into the washing machine. That's why it's important if you have a load that is larger than five kilograms, where you have more than five stain strips, please mark the first five that you give uh, that you load into the machine in some in some way. Make an X X on the sebum so you know these are one of this is one of the first five. Um, yeah, that's important. Um, the norm, the other steps, it's a very normal, you, you do the washing as, as you know, it. when the cycle is finished, uh, you have to remove the, re remove the load off, out of the machine. And then you uh, separate the stain strips from the load. You also take out every, any other specimen like the, um, gentleness of action fabric, um, or um, the uh, temperature loggers, um, and you take them. You, you take them out. Um, the base load that we have, it's used for alkalinity, and the stain strips, or the the white part of the stain strip, this is used for LAS. Um, so we will now go on with the alkalinity method. Um, this method might be known for most of you. It's been in the um, IC6456 for years. And what we measure here is the residual alkalinity of the detergent solution. And we take the difference of the alkalinity between the residual water from the load and the water that is used for washing. The biggest difference to the fifth edition is that we don't have to measure the alkalinity of the reference machine anymore. Um, this makes it easier for, for you because you don't have to do um, additional alkalinity measurement. And um, so we found out in, in um, comparing data that the measurement of the alkalinity of the resonance machine does not um, improve the repeatability or, or reproducibility. So that's why it's taken out because it doesn't give you any um, positive effect. Uh, coming now to some equipment that you might have to know, uh, use. The first of all is, of course, the separate spin extractors. Um, I have taken here also the um, requirements, the specification for the spin extractor. It's actually quite important to um, fulfill these measurements, and you have to make sure that your spin extractor, this is a picture of one I've taken from the internet. Um, so, and I think we have a similar one with us, um, how they look like and um, yeah. There are special requirements on the um, RMC after the spinning of a cotton load and also for a synthetic blends load. Um, it's written here and you should check this on a regular basis because otherwise it's hard to get an a good uh, repeatability and, of course, a good, uh, reproducibility. So next equipment here, I have written here a pH meter. Uh, I think most of you have it. Um, I've written the um, accuracy that is used here also. And then, of course, you need um, other equipment like a scale. You have two different scales because for the base load, you need a scale that has a better resolution, of course. Um, uh, or first resolution, you need need to uh, wait more. And for the titration mass, of course, you need a much better resolution. You need be beakers with stirrers. That's something you should have. And um, for the titration equipment, it's again written here um, that it's preferred if you have an automatic titration. It's easier. You have um, less errors if you do this titration um, with an automatic device. This usually is, gives more repeatable uh, results. You can do still manual titration. Um, it's still allowed, 
um, if your uh, lab staff is trained well enough, um, it will give you also quite some good results. Okay, now we come to the alkalinity measurement. So after the completion of the program, you have to take out the load of the washer. Uh, you remove, as I said, the stain strips, the goa specimens, temperature loggers, anything else what you have in. And then you weigh the base load, um, of course, without um, all of the specimens that I set here. And now the important part comes, you have to split the load into bundles. And as we will use, um, yeah, larger loads than a 3.5 kilogram. Each load will consist of one sheet, two pillowcases, and six towels. I will give you an example um, in a few minutes how this will look like. Um, before spinning, of course, you have to um, rinse out the spin extractors to get rid of anything uh, what was left over in the spin extractor before. This you can do also by putting water in, spin it out, and, and then tilt the, um, the spin extractor to get any water which is left over uh, out of the spin extractor. And then you load the bundles in a defined order. First of all, you take the sheet, um, you lay it in a kind of a circle on, on the bottom, then the two pillowcases also in a kind of a circle and above five towers and with the six towers you will cover up. Unfortunately, I could not find any pictures how it's shown, uh, that show how it's done. The bundles will all be spun immediately or let's say closely after the, or shortly after the cycle has finished. Um, you collect the extracted water and afterwards you uh, should take a note of the uh, of the mass of the bundle. Why? Because then you can see if this is in the, um, as I said before, the spec specification of the spin extractor, of the spin performance of the extractor. Uh, if you have spun all the defined bundles, you combine the extracted water from the bundles, mix it, and within one hour, you, sh you should titrate it. If the titration can it can't be done within one hour, it's possible. You should store the liquid in a closed bottle because by uh, taking up carbon dioxide from the surrounding, from the air, um, the pH value can change a little bit. And that's will give you an, um, yeah, a wrong result or a change result. <clears throat> yeah, what happens with the remaining items that are not in the bundles? They are also spun. Um, or weighted before the spinning, then they are spun, and then they are weighted after the spinning. The extracted water from this bundle is weighted and also discarded. You don't do anything with this, so no titration with this of this um, extra bundles. The on the next slide I have an example. Um, if you have an eight kilogram load, this eight kilogram load usually consists of three sheets, 12 pillowcases, and 25 towels. The number of towels can be uh, different because, as you know, you have to um, adjust the load, the weight of the load size, uh, of the load. Um, out of this, of course, you can calculate, you can make three bundles that consist of one sheet, two pillowcases, and six towels. And those bundles you spin, you combine the extracted water and titrate. The remaining items, uh, in my case, it would be six pillowcases and seven towels. They are also spun, but the water that we have here is then discarded. So after you have combined the extracted, uh, the, the extracted water, um, you take out a defined amount of this um, extract and you titrate it with uh, 0 0.1 normal hydrochloric acid to a pH value of 4.5. As I said before, um, an automatic titration is preferred 
and then you calculate the uh, alkalinity. For alkalinity, I've given here the formulas because it's still uh, it's it's quite easy. You first um, determine the uh, the um, alkalinity of the extracted um, water. Then you do the same, of course, with the laboratory supply water with which you with which you wash. Um, then you take the difference of this um, well, of those both terms, and you get the um, increased alkalinity. And this you uh, multiply then with the remaining moisture content of the load after um, the washing cycle, and then you get the alkalinity of your test result. This shouldn't be very new for you. Um, most labs should have done it before. And still, I want to uh, point out, be very careful with what you are doing. This is the end of the alkalinity. Um, are there any questions? I can't hear anything. Okay. If there are no questions. Can anyone hear me? Yes, we hear yep, you, Michael. We hear okay you. because I, <laughs> yeah, because because Zoom tells me I, I'm not connected. That's why a little I was a little bit uh, uh, wondering. Uh, okay, I see I see reactions also here from Christian. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Because yeah, I was a little bit um, puzzled because there was nothing. Okay. So if there are no questions, we will go on to um, the LAS method. Um, so the LAS method is completely different to, to the um, alkalinity measurement because what we measure here is residual uh, or a specific residual detergent component, uh, which is called LA LAS, which means, uh, which is a linear alkyl benzene sulfonate, uh, which is um, anionic uh, surfactants, which is in the detergent. Um, what we do, as, as I already said, um, we use the unsoiled swatch of the stain strip. And the good thing and the big advantage compared to the alkalinity is uh, we can measure the rinse performance in washers and also washer dryers because washer dryers or measurement of alkalinity in a washer dryer is not possible if you have a, let's say, continuous cycle or if you want to measure the, the drying performance of a washer dryer. And I took here, this is just a couple of minutes before the meeting. Um, you can do it with the cold water stain strip and also with the standard stain strip because on both you have the uh, an, an unsoiled part. And there's no unsoiled part in the wool stain, uh, stain strip, but um, theoretically you can also buy the, the white unsoiled swatch and add it and if you want to measure it for, for wool, you can also do it. Um, but that's not, this is not the focus. So with the other um, stains, you measure the washing performance. But with the unsoiled part, uh, you measure the LAS rinsing performance. Um, coming to the equipment, this is a little bit different. It looks it's also a little bit more equipment. Some of, the of you have maybe to buy additional equipment which they haven't had before. Um, the first of all is a UV spectrophotometer. It's not the same as you use for the determination of the um, washing performance. Um, it's, it's something completely different. You have to um, take care of the wavelength range. The, it should be go, it should go down to 190 nanometers and, and should also include 350 nanometers to 
measure in the range where we want to measure. The photometric range is also given. There are other specification given in the standard. I have not put it in here. It might be a little bit uh, too long. Um, the next are quartz cuvettes. Um, I have to tell you quartz cuvettes is really important. They are the most expensive cuvettes that you can buy. There are cheaper ones that made are, that are made of, out of normal glass or even plastic. The problem with those cuvettes is um, you cannot measure in the 220 nanometer range where we are. Um, you will not see anything there. So it's not possible to use um, cheaper cuvettes, the quartz cuvettes. I don't know what the prices are now, but they used to be 70 to 80 euros per cuvette. So handle them with care. They are quite expensive. Um, you need an orbital shaker for the um, ex um, extraction. I have given here then, well, we have found out that the orbits that we used here in different labs are usually between four and 20 millimeters. And the shaker speed should be um, 350 RPM um, or above. You need will need also some more equipment like this uh, volume, volumetric flasks. Uh, you need scales. The scales have to be or have to have quite some good resolution and, and accuracy. Um, this is something uh, you, sh you should take care of. So here's an example uh, what we have. Uh, you can see a scale, which is also um, takes out some of the environmental effects uh, like air and so on or airflow. And um, you might recognize it. It's also on a, spe a special uh, weighing table, so the there are no um, so the, the the accuracy is is much better. You don't have to have such a uh, special table, but um, if you measure in in such a small uh, ranges, it's recommended to have something like this. Next to it, you need some more equipment, magnetic stirrer. You might also already have stir bars, um, pipettes for transferring. Um, this is not 100% a must, but it makes life much easier from my experience if you have something like this. And you need some glass pipettes uh, for transferring into the uh, glass cuvettes before measurement. Um, What's also quite important is you need some sample bottles. Um, we they should be made from uh, polyethylene. Um, main reason for this is the weight. If you would take um, made, uh, sample bottles made of glass, um, they would be, of course, much um, heavier. And this would also limit your uh, capacity on your um, shaking device. Um, they should have a volume of 500 milliliters. And we have specified here diameter because we found that this is, um, if we, we narrow it down to this diameter, um, the results are better reproducible because if you have a wider or, or a narrower diameter, um, there might be some effects um, that you, we cannot um, explain and, and maybe we see some um, differences in the, in the um, measurements afterwards. And what is quite important is you need distilled water. Um, we have given here some um, specification that you need to have. Um, what is important is that there should be no uh, relative peak absorbance um, greater than 0 0.02 to 0.002 uh, absorbance in the range between where we measure. The procedure how to measure it, I have not explained here, it's given in NXJ. Um, if you buy distilled water, this is usually given, um, but you can also use, um, if you have a, have a reverse osmosis in your lab, you can use this water if this fulfills the specification. But this is something, um, if you do it like this, you should check it from time to time on regular basis um, that the specifications are still fulfilled. Now, coming now to the um, um, LAS measurement is, um, how to say it? it's It's a lot of text. Um, it's also written here, but I want to give you the, uh, in, in the standard it's written, I want to give you the most important parts of this. 
So after finishing the wash test, um, you remove the stain shot from the towers. This is what you should have done also before. After this, you remove the unsoiled uh, test swatch from your marked stains if your load set is larger than five kilogram. Up to five kilogram, you remove all of those unsoiled uh, swatches, but for the larger ones, you take this those ones uh, where you have marked this, the stains with before. Um, the swatches are then dried in the climate chamber. I think drying might not be the 100% correct term. I would say they are climatized in the climate chamber. Um, for instance, by hang drying them on a rack and using packs to, um, to, to fix them um, for at least 16 hours. Um, why do we say do it in a, in a climate chamber? Um, the fabric um, should have a defined, um, let's say, co constitution after the drying. If you would dry it completely, you could have almost zero um, uh, residual moisture in, in the in the or moisture in the um, fabric. If you have it um, in a more humid condition. It might be seven or eight percent, and this would be um, also, of course, then um, a difference in the weight of the swatch. And that's why, if you want to have defined conditions, we said do it in a climate chamber. All those steps here, sorry, uh, you have to be very careful um, because you, you're working in a in a washer lab, and you might have um, detergent. Um, you might use detergent there, and if you are, don't have um, a clean environment, clean um, hands, clean other equipment, you might have cross contamination. So that's why we say, okay, use please use clean equipment like clean tweezers, clean gloves. Do not, after weighing in um, detergent, go directly there and. Uh, handle with those watches because this might lead to cross contamination and to effects that uh, where you wonder afterwards why you have an um, increased um, LAS measurement. The weighing of the swatches um, can be done or, um, in the or it's recommended to do it, it in the climate chamber. Um, a lot of labs don't have such a um, good scale uh, in the climate chamber like we also have. Um, for this, you can take the, the swatches and put them each or the, for each test um, in a, a labeled plastic bag or the plastic bottle. It's just to avoid humidity effects. In some labs, you, you might not see any difference because the conditions in the uh, climate chamber are more or less similar to where you measure it. Um, but you have to think we are we have a global standard and there are areas in the world where you have higher temperatures with higher humidity or higher temperatures and low, lower humidity. And you might see some effects. This can be seen. That's why um, it's recommended to put them in a climate chamber in, in plastic bags or in a bottle and then um, to keep the humidity at, the, at roughly at the level, level that we had in the climate chamber. Um, for the um, Extraction, um, you should take the 500 milliliter sample bottles, label them, and weigh roughly 500 milliliters, but you should note the weight, the exact weight, um, into each bottle. Um, then you take the bottle of the scale, you zero the scale, and you put your swatches on the scale take and take the note. This you do for all samples. Before, but at this, this moment, you don't put the swatches into, um, into the, the, the bottle because this is now the, the time uh, important step. So first you weigh all the swatches and then within a short time period, you take those uh, swatches and put them into the bottle. We have also some other methods, an alternative, which I uh, reuse in at BSH in our labs. We have a um, 
dispenser that is calibrated that every time uh, we we use it, it gives us a relatively exact amount of roughly 100 milligram. We have a calibration before um, that we know, okay, it's 100 point something gram. And if we pour it uh, five times, we have five, 500 milliliters there. So for this, you can weigh the swatches into the sample bottle before and then add the 500 milliliter by dispenser. This works a little bit faster. So if you want to um, accelerate it a little bit, make it a little bit easier, um, it's recommended to have such a dispenser. The next step is actually the time critical step. Um, as I said, you now put all the weights, the, the weighted swatches into the corresponding bottle and close the cap. Then you put all the bottles on the shaker, you fix them, and you shake it for 60 minutes. Um, be careful, please read in the manual how much weight you can load onto your um, shaker because um, this 350 RPM might limit um, the maximum weight you have you can you can uh, have. And if you put more on it, um, it's possible that either the device is damaged or it will not reach the 350 RPM. And yeah, quite important. You shake it for 60 minutes. And after shaking it, um, or after finishing this, you remove the bottles from the shaker, you uh, open the bottles and you take out um, the swatches, usually by uh, using a tweezer. Um, and this should also be done in, in five minutes. After this, um, you have some more time because now um, you can, well, you should let the sample bottles rest for at least 30 minutes to allow the sedimentation of, of fibers and so what is still in there. Um, you can put the cap on it, but you should not um, screw the cap. And yeah, then you come to the actual measurement of the um, of the samples. Um, first, you should prepare a, a blank. A blank is uh, is this done with with the distilled water because this is then taken or subtracted from the um, absorbance that is measured in your sample. Um, you fill it twice and expel it twice, and then you fill the cuvette, cuvette with the sample. Um, I have a picture here. Um, if you have to buy um, uh, a new device because you don't have a um, um, a UV spectrophotometer at the moment, um, I can recommend you to get an, a device where you have a, a such a sample changer so we can add up to 15 samples at once, uh, close the lid, press a button, and then it measures um, the 15 samples in, I think, less than one minute. So if you uh, have to buy something new, there are some um, possibilities it will definitely increase the speed of your your measurement yeah after doing this you have uh, the absorbance value of your your sample the very important point comes now what to do with it you need a calibration curve to see how much um, um, las you have and the, the calibration curve might be even the trickiest part the hardest part of it um, you don't have to do it every time. Um, we say you have to do it when you use a new batch of detergent. Then you should do this because um, there might be a batch to batch variation. Um, as I said, why is it why is the, the sampling of the detergent so important? Um, we use a powder detergent, the ICP, base detergent or the ICA star detergent, which is actually the same. Um, they are powders, they are manufactured by spray drying. And um, what you have inside is, if you take out the sample, um, it's not 100% homogeneous. It gets worse, the smaller the sample are, it, the worse is the homogeneity. So um, Marcus, who is also currently with us here, uh, he, he developed a sample procedure um, to minimize these effects. And um, 
and it's actually quite low tech, but it works very nice. Um, the recommendation that we have um, is to do the sampling of the detergent before you start testing. Most of you should already have received the um, detergent. And before you start with the actual um, performance testing, um, I recommend to do the um, sampling with the um, bucket of, of detergent of the base powder um, before the testing. Um, Afterwards, you will see that the base powder is actually more homogeneous. Also, this might be also a good effect for the washing itself. Um, I have written here in the last sentence on this, this slide, do not just shake the bucket because some people think by just shaking a little bit, um, you will receive a, a good homogeneity. Um, I can assure you, you will definitely not get it. Um, I have written here the the procedure, how it works, but I think it might be easier if you see it on pictures. So what you do, you put on each side, side is maybe the wrong term, but um, north, east, south, and west. And then you start with the north facing to you. You tip over um, the bucket again. So you will come to this point, to the initial position. Then you turn it by 90 degrees. And in this case here, the, now the E is looking towards you and you would tip it over one, two, three, four times again. Then you turn it again. Then you uh, come to south, do the same, turn it around, come to the west, um, tip it over, turn it around, and then you will start here or you come to the initial position, which is the N. Then you open the bucket and you take out a sample. Um, you can do it by with a, such kind of spoon. You can do it directly by dipping in with a beaker um, and take out the sample. Um, and with this sample, we prepare what we call the stock one solution. The stock one solution is a, a solution where you have roughly, roughly 10 gram per liter of base detergent. Um, as I, I've already told you, you take out the sample, which is eight, eight to 12 gram, roughly, and know the weight. Um, you transfer it into this, uh, to the largest uh, volumetric flask that we have here, the one liter flask, and you rinse the beaker with distilled water to get everything into the uh, flask. Afterwards, you fill the beaker, uh, uh, the, the, the volumetric flask, um, to the one liter marking and then add a magnetic stirrer. Don't do it the other way around because then you will have, a, of course, a wrong volume. Um, and this you then put on the magnetic stirrer and stir it for 10 minutes. You will see that the um, solution will not be a clear solution. You will still see particles. This is very normal because the base detergent will not dissolve 100%. Um, Michael, just one yeah. question. You say rinse the beaker with distilled water. What yes. do you mean by that? Do, um, you, do you discard it? No, Wouldn't this this uh, this rinsing rinsing water is of course uh, the, um, um, collected in the volumetric flask. Okay, yeah. so it's it's. Wouldn't it be also okay just to, to take this, the rest of the sentence away? And say, yeah, okay, I, tra I transfer the detergent into the volumetric task. Um, yes. <laughs> and then Could I fill up to one lead. You mean something like this? Yes. Okay, no problem. Yeah, you could do it. I was just confused. Sorry, thank you. Okay, no problem. Um, okay, after the 10 minutes stirring, you have to stock one solution. Um, you let it stir and, and meanwhile you prepare the volumetric flask for the uh, stock two solution. The stock two solution will have a, um, a 
a concentration of roughly one gram per liter now. Um, you put this flask on the scale and you uh, tear the scale, so you zero the scale. And while taking this, uh, while still steering, um, you take 10 milliliter with the pipette from stock one and transfer it to the flask. And um, by taking the, the, the mass of the um, stock one solution, you don't have to take exactly 10 milliliter. It could be also 9.5 or 10.5, something like this. Because as we measure the, the, the mass, um, we are much more precise than with the pipette. And yeah, then you fill this um, this uh, flask with, with the stock for the stock two solution with distilled water to the um, uh, 100 milliliter marking. You add a magnetic stirrer and you mix it for five minutes on a, a magnetic stirrer, and then you have the stock two solution. And from the stock two solution. Uh, we will now prepare the uh, working standards. Um, we will have five um, working standards with um, detergent in and one working standard. This is this WS000, uh, where it's just the distilled water that you use. Um, you label those flasks. Um, and then for each flask, you take the appropriate amount of stock two and note the mass. The amount um, is given in, in, in the standard. This is, you can read it also from this, this uh, naming here. This WS010 means it's one, roughly one gram. This will be roughly two gram, five gram, 10 gram, or 25 gram of the um, stock two solution. Um, you fill the flask up to the marking with distilled water and then stir it for three minutes. Um, and you will see those solutions are usually um, solutions where you don't see any particles left. Also with this uh, highest standard here. And then you do this. Um, you you do the calibration for this. Um, and then you have one curve. And as I wrote here, you repeat it. Uh, you, you measure uh, the three repetitions means you repeat, uh, you have three uh, repetitions per working standard for the measurement. If you are finished with this, you have done it once. So, so the one calibration curve. What you need is we need three independent calibration curves. So you have to do everything all over again, starting from the sampling with the same bucket. Please do the sampling, not just take out this uh, second probe, do the sampling again with this uh, tipping over and, and turning um, because you might have had some effect already after the first one. Um, you pre prepare stock one, out of the stock one, you prepare stock two, and you prepare the working standards. The only working standard you don't have to prepare, of course, is the blank with the, with no um, detergent in. And then you do the UV measurement. And in the ideal case, um, this is uh, from, from our lab, we have three uh, independent calibration curves. Um, each of the calibration curve has an R squared value of roughly one. Here one is 0 0.9999, the other two uh, have an R squared of one. Um, the calibration curve, the, the limits that we set is for the individual calibration curves, the R squared must be 0 0.9995 or above. This is here in this case fulfilled. And then you have a, um, this is also everything done by this Excel spreadsheet by, by Marcos. Um, uh, you combine the calibration curve and you will also get an R square here. And this R square should, should be larger than 0 0.9990. And as you can see here for this calibration curve, they are, all measurements are on the same uh, graph and the R square is 0.9999. So, yeah, as a summary, and this is something um, I 
want to point out is there are some things to consider and the start everything starts with the property uh, sampling of the detergent um, as long as we will use um, um, powder detergent there might be some inhomogeneities here um, um, a liquid detergent shouldn't have it um, so this is something very important the quality of the calibration curve uh, we have also seen in the development of this method is quite important that's why we have those high um, specification for the for the r square of the calibration curves the quality of the dis distilled water for the extraction is also very important and should be checked regularly if you all, all, all only buy um, the uh, distilled water by some companies it might be okay, but if you use your own uh, the, uh, water by uh, reverse osmosis, you should check it on a regular uh, basis. Ma uh, as a may I add something? Yes, of course, Marcos. Um, because um, we had such problem because we are using such iron exchanges. So do not all, only check it regularly check each batch which are you preparing and it's um, it's better to prepare a big big, big batch of um, distilled water and then then check it once and not to always prepare one liter after the other and only check uh, not every batch so it's important to check every batch uh, for for residuals uh, in the distilled water because um, these ion exchanges um yeah they are they are uh, they are um something inside which 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 may absorb uh, in this in in the range where we are measuring so that is from my point of view very important and that was in all the round robin tests we had on the on the ls method one of the crucial points yes Thank you, Marcos. Um, yeah, the other two steps I also already explained. The cleanliness is crucial, and also um, you have some time critical steps in the LAS performance. And now, coming to questions. I mean, there there might be some. Yes, Dorata. Hi, I have a question. During uh, your presentation, we can see that we should use uh, 500 milliliters fla uh, volumetric uh, fl bottle. Yes. Uh, for each sample, you need 500 milliliters. We cannot shake it with, for example, one only 100 milliliters with the, of distilled water on the shaker of it really must be 500 milliliters. Yeah, 500 milliliters per five, for five swatches. Um, for five swatches. So yes. so we can, we should put uh, comp, um, five swatches as, as complete to one uh, fla uh, for one bottle and yes. add 500 milliliters. Is possible to put every one single swatch to the little uh, bottle and uh, put to the every uh, 100 milliliters of uh, really it must be together. Um, yes, as a, so you could do this, uh, but I think it's not uh, the intention of the round robin test. Um, yeah, what of course, would, what, but during the different tests, can we make every one switch uh, a single to the single little bottle of 100 milliliters and made a measurement on every one and match some average of our um, measurement? Theoretically, it's possible. It's, it's also... Um, Still, in, in, still described in the um, in the sixth edition. Um, we don't want to do it for the round robin test here. Okay. You can do it uh, for 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 development. I can see it's fully okay. Um, okay. I think it's uh, for development. It gives you uh, some information about the evenness of the rinse. So are all 
parts of the uh, of, of your your load rinsed equally this is an information you might want to have uh, for your own development but um for this and also for routine measurement i mean um, the machines are get bigger are getting bigger and bigger and you have uh, nine kilogram 10 kilogram and even beyond machines so i think we uh, have introduced in the isc standard now um, up to 25 kilogram and would, if you would extract every of one of those 25 swatches um, this would need a lot of time and especially for uh, laboratories um, which do it for for okay. smart surveillance okay. and so on Okay, so it is clear and I have the second question. This is 500 milliliters for the five uh, samples in the one bottle. And if we have, for example, from some liter lo uh, little load, for example, only three swatches, we put uh, 300 milliliters or no, also five, 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 500. 500 because okay. we want to have the, the bottle as full as possible to uh, in the extraction during the extraction okay that, that's Thank the you. reason when you have three three swatches you take also take 500. okay okay thank you a lot hi i have another question yeah yes I I don't know if I cannot see on the on the draft that, but do you need to do some cuvet check in order to check if the cuvet is good enough to do the readings or not? Uh, let me have a have a look in this. Um, it's recommended that you check um, if you use. A, a lot of or different cuvettes, you should check if they have all the sim similar um, behavior. If you if you have them um, either by just air or with water in, that they give the same output with an empty, um, with a black. Um, I'm not sure if this is, if we still have it in. I, we've, we used to have it in as far as I remember. I'm not sure if this is, yeah, in the in the European version, um, we have it in. There's a, a quality check of of, of materials, and yes. uh, if 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 it's covered completely in the in the IC, it should be in. But I don't know exactly at the moment. Yeah. Yes, Markus, that's right. In the um, EN version, it's inside. It's called cuvette matching. But yes. I'm also not sure whether it is inside in the IC. Yeah, we, we the the order is a little bit different here. There is a quartz cuvette and glassware cleaning and handling in general cleaning, periodic glass cleaning. Um, I can check it. Um, if not, might be an idea to take it up. Thank you. Yeah, Ralf here. I, I have no question, but I have a comment on uh, the statement already from Markus regarding the preparation of the, um, the test water, the bee distilled water. Uh, if you are using an uh, ionic exchanger, <clears throat> we are using a double system with, uh, with two uh, systems in the area. And then uh, if this device is not used for a longer time, you should um, <clears throat> rinse out this device uh, quite enough that uh, the water is uh, clear because in the beginning you will not match uh, the requirements of the uh, standard. And then you think maybe uh, this device is not working. So <clears throat> rinsing of the device is uh, very important. Yes. Yes, that was the reason for my hint. 
Okay. Yeah, and then additionally, um, <clears throat> it's also what Marcus already mentioned. Um, you should not um, <clears throat> prepare only uh, small volumes. You can uh, prepare uh, larger volumes and store it in high density uh, containers, uh, HDPE containers. Uh, that is also um, very good. And uh, the, the, the water keeps the uh, good quality, but nevertheless, uh, when you open this container, you should, uh, we, for our laboratory, we always uh, check also the uh, quality of the water. That's it from my side. Yeah, yeah that, that's a good hint, uh, Ralf, because um, the storage uh, container is important. If you measure it and then store it in a normal plastic bottle, um, they are um, Weichmacher in English. What is Weichmacher? Yeah, I think softener or something. Yeah, like soft, <laughs> there are softener in the material, and this are this is rinsed out by 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 this uh, be distilled water, and with more and more storage time, you get more and more absorbance in the region where we are measuring. So it is it's important that the storage device has uh, has um, an appro appropriate material. We prefer to store it in glass bottles, so then nothing can happen, or you. You, you buy special materials as Ralf suggested. And also the bottle uh, where you squeeze the water out, which you use to fill, uh, rinse cuvettes and so on. It's the same uh, for, for this bottle, for the squeeze bottles. They have to be from special material that they don't um, dilute out uh, the softener, uh, that the water don't, does not uh, um, dilute out the softener of the material. So be very careful with these equipment. Yes. So we have two all, raised hands. No. All, all learnings Marcus. we have we have done in the round robin test in Europe in Europe. Yes. So I think the first one was uh, Lescop. Uh, yes. Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, I would like uh, to ask you about uh, regular check water. Uh, what does it mean? This is my first question. And uh, second question is, uh, what check uh, need to be carried out? Every par parameters of uh, water or, or, or what? What uh, um, we needed? One moment. Um, you should take a spectrum of the, of the, of the water. Mm -hmm. This is, um, I think, the most important part. This is what, what Marcos just said, that you might have um, take those, I think it's not soft enough, it's, it's plasticizers or something like this, it's called in, in English. Um, and, and if you, one moment, I will, you should now see, this is the sixth edition, the CD. And, and if, if you take the uh, spectrum of this um, in, in the range between 200 or, and, and 350 nanometers, you should not see any peaks here and if this is um if your water is spoiled with something like this i think marcus has seen it you see here really uh, absorption peaks already in, in, in this region and this would um then um have an impact on your on your measurements marcus mm -hmm. is correct you see some yes. peaks here in, in that region and then you see here this is now very much enlarged to be honest so it, in this case um um, uh, you would see really big peaks here, and this is definitely something that has an, an impact. Yeah, and, and quality control always means not measure only the wavelengths, which we are referring to for the calculation of the results, but measure this spectrum, as you see, a spectrum yeah. of the range where we are measuring, because... Yeah, complete, you, complete, spe yeah. Yeah. complete spectrum, is, this is... Influences, uh, uh, which, which are on, on the sides of the spectrum beginning, um, and maybe uh, maybe you, are, you have only the shoulder in, in the range where you are measuring, so if you make a spectrum, you have a clearer view of, of, of what is happening. Mm -hmm. And in, in the standard, in the standards, it said always, if you have problems, take a spectrum of the, of the um, sample you are measuring, then, then you will have a clearer view of, of what is happening. So in, in, in cases of doubts or uh, anything, take a spectrum. That's the re recommended way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, okay. Does this answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, Rolando. 
Yes, Michael, thank you. I need just a clarification because uh, on the first uh, slide of the LIS method, you refer to a load five kilo and mention how the number of the swatch we have to measure. You mentioned about up to five, we have to measure five. Something like this. Maybe yes. So if you have a load that is five kilogram or larger, um, or let no do it the other way around. Um, if you have a load uh, um, that is up to five kilogram, so one kilogram to five kilogram, you would take all of the white swatches here. Yes. So in for case, five kilogram. In hmm? case we, have, we are more than five. Yeah. In case you have more than five. Um, you mark the first five swatches that will go into the machine by during the loading procedure. So you know you start, I don't know, an eight kilogram with uh, two pillowcases, four towels, and then you have a towel with um, stain strip. And this so, stain strip is, according should be marked. To the, loading, uh, the loading sequence, you, you mean? Yes, yes. And the first five that you will load in, they should be marked somewhere. It could be an X or something like this here on the, on the uh, sebum stain strip. This means that at the end, the number will be five in total. Yes, and correct. Just a comparison with the actual technical standard we use in Europe. Actually, we use we measure all the swatches, but the, the differences to the IC is that in the future, according to the IC, will be only five. Yeah, actually, uh, the actual standard um, is the second edition from 2022. And there we already have this five uh, measurement of the only five swatches. Okay. Yes, exactly. I have the second <laughs> edition and uh, we measure only the five. Yes. So you, you are still measuring uh, according to the first edition and the first edition is technically withdrawn in Europe. You should use the second edition. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Welcome. Any more questions? No. Yeah, we would have time. So please come yeah. on. This is a very Just complicated one... issue. Please go on. Yes. Just one more question, but relating to alkalinity. I was checking the CD, and if I'm not wrong, for liquid detergent is not needed to measure alkalinity, okay? For liquid detergent? No, uh, I think for liquid, we don't measure it. You're right, you're correct. Yeah, but you can't both, measure it. You can't measure both it type of liquid, L1 and L2, yes? Uh, correct. Yeah. So detergent are neutral, so you don't have an alkalinity. Yes, yeah, okay. So there is no way. To measure anything, you could but try, but less, you will not find anything. But less we could measure, or even less. Yes. Less is yes. not. LAS, you can measure as long as you can measure in any detergent that contains LAS. Yeah. This is currently okay. most in almost all detergent. It might change in the future, but currently uh, you can measure it in almost all detergents. Okay. Thank you. And just one more question related to the the alkalinity procedure, uh, in case we have only one spin extractor in the lab, how can I deal with many bundles to spoon? Um, you spin them one after each other. Um, I think usually this can be done within, I don't know, half an hour, maybe 40 minutes. Um, from my experience, this shouldn't be a huge effect. If you would take okay. longer, there isn't, there isn't, uh, I think it's a recommendation to uh, keep the, the load inside a kind of an airtight bag. So yeah, are, use, use a plastic bag. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you need longer than a certain time, I think the, they say up to one hour or so. In any case, you should put a load which is not spun immediately 
into a plastic bag and store it um, and continue with that bundle which which is uh, to be to be spun and then uh, change it when the bundle is spun and takes the next load out of the plastic bag. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions, I thank you all for participating. Um, Rainer, yeah? Yeah, I think uh, especially uh, Michael for his presentation, which was, I think, very interesting. And Markus, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I would take the chance because there are so many people online. Um, uh, in, the, in one week, we have the um, we have the webinar about the Excel template, and I would recommend the the, the regional leaders to send out uh, the uh, the Excel template so that everyone who's participating in the round robin test can have a look in the tables or in the sheets before, um, so to come up with questions. Because if you see it the first time in the webinar. It um, you, <laughs> you won't come to questions if you see see it in advance and maybe you try a little bit with this uh, tables uh, to, uh, to, um, to to see if, if everything is clear for you because there are so much um, columns and rows more let's say more more columns with with this parameter because we we can't discuss every parameter in detail so I recommend to 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 look into the evaluation sheet before the webinar um, to to come up with questions or to make sure to make clear that everything is uh, to make sure that everything is clear for you yes Thank i you. think this is a very important webinar it's next week uh, tuesday where marcus will guide us with the evaluation sheet and the regional leaders are really um, recommended to send it out better today than later any more comment? Oh, Phil. Yeah. Markus, would you mind just uh, letting everyone know which is the final version, which is the last version of the Excel spreadsheet? It's uh, number five, version number five. It's the last one. Thank you. But for, for the for the for the uh, for the webinar or for the understanding, it's not important which version you are using, but for the data with filling with the data version number five up to now is the latest one maybe we will have more thank you you're yes. welcome thank you very much so we see us again next week on tuesday thank you very much bye 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 thank you bye 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 bye, bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.